if I said the word conflict and asked you to word associate with that, you'd probably come up with a lot of negative connotations. Generally, people tend to think about conflict as negative and something that should be avoided. But conflict is not inherently negative. For instance, competing for a prize is a form of conflict. It is the way that conflict is handled that can be the issue and negative. Conflict is inevitable. It will always be present in any organizational setting. So it really is important to know how to manage conflict and communicate within conflict effectively. For this chapter, I want you to know what conflict is and the aspects involved. Uh, think about too that the process conflict, which is not in our book, I mean, that, those steps are important. Uh, you'll want to know the steps of principled negation method and understand uh, of one we're using called the Four Horsemen and their antidotes. Understand the strategies of conflict resolution, approaching conflict, advantages and disadvantages, and how a situation impacts the style choice. Interpersonal conflict is defined as a felt struggle between two or more interdependent individuals over perceived incompatible differences in beliefs, values, goals, or over differences in desires for esteem, control, and connectedness. That definition has a lot going on. Breaking it down, interpersonal conflict has four aspects. First, we feel struggle. This is probably what you think about when you hear conflict. There is a struggle, interaction of some sort, or opposition. Second, we have interdependence. In interpersonal conflict, the parties, must, the parties involved must be interdependent in some way. In other words, only if what one party does affects the other party or parties is there potential for conflict. Third is differences. I would clarify this as perceived differences. The parties must perceive that the other party is interfering with their ability to accomplish goals, live out beliefs or values, or other things. That perception is key, and the perception does not have to be accurate for there to be conflict. For instance, think about two people up for the same raise, and both can get it. There's not conflict there. Their goals aren't interfering with each other, but what if one mis- perceives or perceives misunderstands that both cannot get the same raise, then conflict is possible. Even if two people are up for the same raise and only one can get it, that doesn't mean the conflict will be hostile, but they are still struggling potentially with competing goals. Fourth, we have feeling. This is the affective or emotional element. There are feelings involved within the conflict. I want to dive a little bit deeper into this element of conflict. Our understanding of emotions during conflict comes from Darwin's research. He found that animals who feel safe display positive emotions while those that feel threatened display negative emotions. Based on this logic, it would make sense that we're more likely to react positively when conflict is handled constructively and both individuals are respective, uh, but react negative negatively when we feel like we're being attacked. Think about a time you've been in conflict and felt angry. Perhaps that anger happened because you felt disrespected or you were embarrassed. Anger is what we call a basic or core emotion. The other five basic emotions are disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. Maybe you had that in a public speaking class. With a core emotion like anger, there are times when other emotions or unmet needs are impacting anger and we use anger to hide raw feelings like feeling disrespected or embarrassment before the surface. You can see kind of an interesting reapplication of the iceberg analogy you may have seen in a counseling or psychology class. Uh, this is coming from the Gottman Institute. When we can see all of the other emotions or experiences driving the emotions we recognize, that can help us with our communication and conflict. All the emotion serves a purpose or a function. We experience it for some reason. However, how we express that emotion determines how the emotion functions or influences the conflict itself. For instance, instead of screaming because you're angry, what if you step back and say, I'm feeling disrespected right now? You're more likely to handle the conflict in a constructive manner. Expressing anger responsibly includes admitting that you are angry. This goes back to earlier in the class when we talked about how leaders express feeling. You're not attacking the person in anger. You're figuring out what triggered the anger so that you can deal with the issue, not blame or vent or turn your anger on someone who doesn't deserve it. As a personal aside, don't bring it home either. <laughs> emotions affect a lot of things, so understanding them is key. Our bodies react physiologically to our emotions, increase heart rate, lump in your throat, tenseness, perspiration. Our emotions can cloud our judgment or interpretations. 
It might be difficult to think clearly and rationally when you are taken over by negative feelings. And certain emotions are even associated with certain behaviors. Feeling attacked, you might close yourself off, walk away from the situation. Others might attack back to show dominance with their bodies. Importantly, we are not passive in these processes or in all of this communication. With training, we can make choices during conflict episodes that can help us utilize our emotions more constructively, keep us from acting out, and improve our overall ability to communicate. Now let's look at conflict types. You'll recognize that the content and relational dimensions from our book, um, but process conflict, not in the book. We'll briefly touch on the first two dimensions, but be sure to look at the deeper explanations in our textbook on those. Content conflict is some called times, sometimes called task conflict. This dimension of conflict involves perceived differences of beliefs and values or perceived differences of opinion ideas on what goals or problem to address and how to address them. Content conflict can sometimes be a good thing because they help people achieve a better understanding of tasks is, task issues and therefore improve decision making. Relationship conflict refers to participants' perceptions of their connections to one another. They might involve issues of esteem, control, or affiliation. This type of conflict involves factors that impact people's ability to maintain positive interpersonal relationships. For instance, this could be related to personality differences, communication incompetence, and a lot of other things. There are some people that have trouble working together in general. That can be a form of relationship conflict. These two dimensions are always bound together in human communication and provide a lens for looking at conflict. Content conflict is about an issue of what's right and wrong or where we're going to go. Relationship conflict is how people are connected to each other. Research also suggests another type of conflict that I want you to know. Process conflict. This dimension is related to the logistics of accomplishing a task. With process conflict, the issue isn't about differences between people, values, how to approach a goal. Instead, it's differences in how people accomplish this goal together. This is when conflict arises from disagreement over task divisions and responsibility. Real life example here might be who, who unloads the dishwasher and how is that done? In the workplace, who contacts the client? Who sets up the meeting? How do you set up the meeting? It could be other differences with time management, group contribution, and roles. Conflicts over social loafing, like sitting on your phone on your lunch break maybe, or having issues finding time for everyone to meet. Those are all process conflicts. They happen a ton. <laughs> Uh, all three dimensions together can increase potential for conflict. On its own, content task conflict is less destructive because the focus is on the issue or value, not the relationship or the process. Relational conflict can be very destructive because it's often tied to negative emotions, hostility, dislike. This can be destructive itself, but it can also distract from task or process accomplishment. Process conflict can be a major issue because it can signal overarching disagreements and often involves relational conflict too. As we move into talking about conflict resolution, here is a quote to think about. Effective negotiators create a cooperative atmosphere and take the perspective of others. The most productive approaches to negotiation incorporate these two elements by viewing negotiation as a problem-solving process rather than a competitive tug of war. Fisher and Uri, and this is from 1981, present a step-by-step -step method of conflict negotiation. Principled negotiation emphasizes deciding issues on their merits rather than through competitive haggling or through excessive accommodation. Each principle focuses on one of the four basic elements of negotiation, people, interests, options, criteria. First, you want to separate the people from the problem. You become more attentive when you do this to the conflict and avoid defining the situation as like a test of wills. By focusing on the problem, it's not us versus them, but more working together to figure out a solution. One way to do this is to build trust with others. Uh, for example, in a communication setting, perhaps you're providing regular status updates. This can help diffuse strong emotions and keep a conflict from escalating. Next. Focus on interests, not positions. Positions are the opposing points of view in a conflict, while interests refer to the relevant needs and values of the people involved. Another way to think about it is that a position is a public stance, and interest is the reason why they take that position. 
If you focus on positions, you and the others might not see that there's room for agreement and that there are multiple ways to meet the underlying interest. If you can, address interests and positions. That helps to make negotiation more authentic and can lead to a more forward-moving approach to problem solving and communicating. Third, invent options for mutual gains. Think of creative solutions that can benefit both parties. When both sides are sensitive to the other party's interests, you can make it easier to find solutions. But note, this step is impossible unless you engage in the first two steps of separating people from the problem and focusing on interests, not positions. Fourth, Fisher and Urey say that effective negotiation requires that objective criteria be used to settle different interests. This helps the situation seem wise and fair. The goal in negotiation is to reach a solution based on principle, not on pressure and criteria. Uh, criteria can come in multiple forms, precedent, professional standards, what a court would decide, moral standards, tradition, scientific judgment. One example is fair procedure. For example, parents might use a forced choice technique for siblings fighting over cake slices. The technique is one sibling cuts the piece, the other gets to pick which one to take. Interestingly, this forced choice technique was used by the United Nations in the law of sea negotiations over deep seabed mining. Half of the sites were going to be mined by wealthy countries with private companies, the other half by the UN on behalf of poorer countries. Poorer countries knew less about the sites and were worried that the private companies would pick the best ones for themselves. To move forward negotiations, the negotiators had the private firm pick two sites they wanted to use and then the UN would select one for themselves. That gave the firms incentive to pick two good or equal sites because they didn't know which one they would end up with. As you know, conflict definitely doesn't just happen in a workplace. Sometimes it's useful to look at conflict research from other fields and apply those principles to organizational conflict. John Gottman is a famous psychologist. He's one of the biggest interpersonal personal communication um, really experts in the field. He runs the Gottman Institute and can predict with over 90% accuracy if a marriage is going to end in divorce by listening to arguments for three minutes. He explains that it isn't about if couples have conflict or not, it is how they talk or argue about that conflict that is the issue. He has identified four signs of a destructive relationship, what he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is a religious image. Uh, they can transfer to organizational leadership communication really clearly, and I've had past students tell me this was a really nice way to understand and remember things from the class, so we'll use that in this course as well. These horsemen often follow in order of each other as the conflict escalates. First is criticism. This is the likely, the most common horseman. Uh, criticism is when you complain about a person's character. Critical talk is usually filled with you statements because they are focused on the person, not the action. They also have always and never statements which suggest a consistent negative component. So for example, you never think about how your actions affect others. You can never get anywhere on time and don't care how much strain it puts on us to wait for you. You can hear somebody like in a team at work say that, right? Uh, but this kind of thing, oh, it can make the receiver feel hurt, attacked, rejected. It can become a pattern of criticism that leads to the other horsemen. The antidote to this is what Gottman calls the gentle startup. It involves using complaints instead of criticism. While criticism focuses on character, complaints can focus on the behavior or issue, which is a healthy way to voice a problem. And you should voice problems at work. So we, I'm not suggesting here that you should not be critical. It's just that when you are being critical, framing it as a complaint will have less negativity because it isn't about blame, but instead communicating a need. So framing it this way helps the other person to hear it. So in a gentle startup, you want to make a straightforward comment about an issue, use I statements, express a need in a positive fashion. For example, I need you to submit the report by four o'clock on Friday and I will follow up with you if it's not in my inbox is more of a next step uh, versus focusing on you always turn things in late. <laughs> you use I language, avoiding you statements. Uh, for the example here on the screen is arriving to the meeting late is becoming a pattern. It makes it really difficult for us to keep moving because we need the update from your team. Huge difference between that top one to the bottom. 
but not really that hard of a communication pivot. Criticism leads to contempt. Contempt is a statement or nonverbal behavior, behavior that is intentionally mean. Mocking people, eye rolling, name calling, mimicking, I can envision in my head that sort of wave of the hand and turning your body away from that person. In fact, like the image that's on the screen right now, I know I've done that. Uh, this can convey disdain, can communicate a sense of maybe false superiority, I'm better than you, you're less than me. Contempt is powered by the buildup of long-held negative thoughts. It will negatively impact trust and cooperation and can lead to more conflict rather than reconciliation. If we're sticking with a scenario where a coworker is late for a meeting, an example of contempt is how hard is it to check your watch? Probably tricky when all you do at work is try and land a date with Alex in marketing. Pathetic. <laughs> All right, so that, again, not gonna work, right? So a short-term antidote for content is describe your feelings and needs. So similar to the criticism antidote, focus on what you need and try to avoid blaming and attacking someone. A long-term antidote is to build a culture of fondness and admiration. Try to focus on what this coworker does well. Appreciate gratitude for positive qualities and actions. Uh, as a real life example here, that would mean for me, if I'm going to try and correct a team member on something that they're not doing well. When I give them that feedback, uh, contempt feedback would be like, why do you suck at entering grades? <laughs> uh, if I'm trying to give positive feedback, I might say, you do a great job when entering the assessment data here. How can we apply that to this? Uh, so it moves it out of that you know, breaking down scenario to something that's going to help them improve and move forward. Again, not saying you can't eventually fire that person for not doing their job correctly, but for trying to build positive team relationships in the meantime, that's the way to go. Next, defensiveness is when you try and defend yourself from a perceived attack by being indignant or claiming to be the victim. This is often a response to criticism, contempt, and complaints. If we feel blamed or unjustly accused, we look for a way to defend ourselves, but this often is an attempt to redirect blame. So you're at fault, not me. It's your fault I'm late to the meetings. I wish you, why didn't you just send it out earlier? Uh, this action escapes, escalates the conflict. Going back to the issue of being late to the meeting, defensiveness would look like, well, if, you've, if you consulted me about a good meeting time, maybe I wouldn't be late. I can't believe you put this at 10 a.m. You know I have a director's meeting right before this. Now, the main antidote to defensiveness would be to take responsibility to, for your role in the situation, even if it's just for a part of the issue. Doing so prevents escalation, and from there, people can work to a compromise. So there's an example underneath that of taking responsibility, saying, you're right, I'm sorry it's hurting the team. You'll notice there you're not saying you're sorry for them. Um, I'm sorry it's hurting the team. I have the director's meeting before this one, and it always runs long. I should have explained that to you when we plan the meeting time. Can we shift our meeting to 10.15 so I will be on time, or could you put me later in the schedule? So it's not shifting blame, it is offering an explanation. Now be careful with this that you're not focusing too much on explanations. It is still ultimately taking responsibility for what's going on. And then I think the best part about this example, proposing a solution. So make it easy for your boss, for your coworkers to move on. Finally, we have stonewalling. Uh, this is withdrawing to avoid conflict and convey disapproval, distance, separation, so shutting down. Uh, it could be stopping listening, giving the other person the silent treatment. Stonewalling can be very frustrating for the other person and make them infuriated. We want to avoid stonewalling as much as we can. One way to do that is, <laughs> and it sounds a little like funny for a BCom class, but one way to do that is physiological self-soothing. This involves calling a timeout, taking a break from the discussion. So as a communication strategy, it's recognizing that you're getting upset and asking for, hey, can we take a break and, and get a cup of coffee and come back to this in 15 minutes? That's physiologically going to help your body calm down. It is a brain chemical, that's a, it's a trick, but it's a, based on research about the way the brain works, we can improve our communication by just pausing. When you withdraw, that is that walk out, that is the, I'm going to walk you to the door of my office and then lock the door <laughs> after I send you through, that's not going to help. Um, so that's not a timeout that's effective, that's just shutting down and that can lead to really big problems within a team. 
For the last big section of this lecture, we're going to look at conflict management styles. So that means you're not pushing the person out of the office. You're going to stay and have this moment of conflict. I'm going to briefly review them here and focus more on how situation impacts style choice. A conflict style is defined as a pattern response or a behavior that people use when approaching conflict. There are five conflict styles that fall on two dimensions. And if it looks a little familiar to the task relationship grid that we went through in an earlier chapter, yeah, it really is. Uh, first off, we have assertiveness. Assertiveness refers to attempts to satisfy one's own concerns, meaning your concern for results or goals. Cooperativeness represents attempts to satisfy the concerns of others. Think of it as a concern for relationships, people, and their concerns. For a brief review, avoiding, bottom left corner, is both an unassertive and an uncooperative style. Those who favor the avoidance style will avoid communicating about the conflict by either delaying addressing the conflict or withdrawing so they don't have to talk about it. They will seem disinterested in the conflict. Competition, top left, is a conflict style of individuals who are highly assertive about pursuing their own goals but uncooperative in assisting others to reach theirs. Generally, this involves aggressive competition or aggressive or competitive communication. Accommodation on the bottom right is unassertive but cooperative conflict style. This is when you ignore your own needs or preferences and are more concerned with maintaining relationships. You go with the what the other wants. This type of style downplays differences and this is that people pleaser mode. Compromise in the middle involves both a degree of assertiveness and cooperativeness. Everyone gets something they want, but likely no one gets all of what they want. Finally, collaboration on the top right requires both assertiveness and cooperation. This involves creative solutions to meet everyone's interests. The book says it is the preferred style, but it is often not realistic. For instance, maybe there's not time to do it. Maybe there's scarce resources. Maybe people cannot both get what they want. Uh, maybe it's just a really trivial matter and it isn't useful or time effective to collaborate. Accommodating might make more sense. People do have preferred ways of managing conflict, but people will also adapt to different styles when conflict isn't being resolved. Let's look at some of the situational factors that come into play when choosing a style. The importance of the task timeline for decision making uh, has a great impact on conflict style. For instance, if the result of conflict is trivial, avoidance might work as a solution. Or if it really matters to the other person but not to you, accommodation might make sense. However, when the goal outcome is more important to you, collaborating, competing, and compromising might make more sense. Time pressure also impacts conflict styles because styles like collaborating and compromising can take a lot of time. If you don't have the ability to deliberate, then those styles will not be used. Finally, other considerations play a role as well. You might ask yourself questions like, can I figure this out with the other party? How important is the relationship compared to reaching my goal? If I let the other person get their way, how does that impact me? Do we need a break before we talk about this issue more? So when we think about conflict, there is a lot at play here. I wanna leave you with one final thought. And you'll see on the screen here a quote that says, conflict doesn't end when it is no longer visible because a decision has been made, one side has won, or the parties have moved on to other issues. Instead, conflict is resolved when the issues have been addressed to the satisfaction of everyone. If conflict has merely been suppressed or delayed, it's not actually resolved. How you handle conflict, how you work with and communicate with the other parties involved is incredibly important. It isn't about winning. That's why there is this relationship dimension to it. That's why considering emotions and what language you use really matters. As you study conflict, think about how to manage it in all facets of your life. What we are learning crosses over from work to personal here. The more you can practice effective conflict management, the better you will get at it and the more confident you will become. I'd also add here, a little off topic from the book, but that if you are managing conflict effectively in the workplace, you're probably going to be a generally happier person, which is going to bleed into your personal life. Conflict is inevitable, but you can control how you talk about it, how you communicate, how you re relate to people, and all of that can have a huge impact in resolution.